Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Ingvild Olsen, the Director for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment here at SAMHSA. We are very pleased to be able to offer this webinar as you prepare your FY22 application for the SOAR grant program. As you know, the SOAR program aims to address the overdose epidemic by increasing access to treatment using FDA-approved medications for the treatment of opiate use disorder, reduce unmet treatment needs, and reduce overdose-related deaths through the provision of prevention, treatment, and recovery activities for opiate use disorder. Using SOAR funds, states and territories have implemented evidence-based practices using several effective and innovative approaches over the last several years. These approaches have resulted in positive outcomes, such as significant increases in client engagement, satisfaction, and retention in care, enhanced transitions for clients re-entering communities from criminal justice settings or other rehabilitative settings, increased naloxone availability, improved integration of wraparound recovery support services, successful family reunification and improved outcomes of child welfare involvement, and expanded access to on-demand treatment. While the SOAR grants have had positive impact across the country, as you are likely aware, we are continuing to lose too many lives to overdose. Provisional data from the CDC indicate that over 100,000, close to 105,000 now, people have lost their lives in the 12-month period that ended last October. We've also seen that some communities are being hit harder by overdoses compared to others. We also know that a proven strategy to reduce overdose deaths is education on and purchase and distribution of naloxone, the medication and a medication that reverses opioid-related overdoses to save lives. And through SOAR funding and other sources, states have been providing naloxone to their communities for some time. But the significant increase in fentanyl-driven overdose deaths that have been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic means we need to do more. And that is why, as part of the FY22 SOAR funding announcement, we've included a naloxone distribution and saturation plan that particularly pays attention to areas and communities with high rates of overdose mortality. To support you in fulfilling the plan and the requirements that are in the application, SAMHSA has partnered with the Opioid Response Network, ORN, to provide you free training modules. These modules include an overview of a modeling study to estimate the number of naloxone kits needed to reduce overdose risk, perspectives from urban and rural settings, and insights from the recovery community. We hope that these modules provide valuable information and insight as you develop your naloxone distribution and saturation plans. We so look forward to continuing to work with you and everyone in every community across the country to make sure that we are continuing to save lives of those impacted by this overdose crisis. Thank you. All right, welcome to my presentation of a lived experience and lessons from the field regarding opioid overdose and naloxone. My name is Dean Lemire. Uh, I work as a director of a couple peer recovery services programs provided remotely throughout the US I supervise peer recovery specialists and provide trainings that help them bridge the recovery and harm reduction divide. And I've been involved in capacity building for harm reduction services in New Hampshire and in Texas. I have two girls who are both extroverted and powerful, and with what little spare time I have, I enjoy rewatching two HBO classics. For this short presentation, I'll take the autobiographical route uh, to where we're headed because I know my story the best. Uh, I'll highlight how my views on substance use and people who use drugs uh, changed drastically throughout my time in recovery and recovery services. I'll highlight some of uh, what my home state of New Hampshire was facing when I got on the helping trade uh, train to curb opioid overdose uh, and what those helping opportunities were. And I'll talk about how we as service providers can use the wisdom I learned uh, from, uh, from my experiences to be even more effective in our service design and delivery. So I started out cute and then life happened. Uh, I would have described my early, earlier life as ordinary um, and even healthy, but learning more about the pathology of mental illness and substance use disorders, I can look back and see many traumas 
uh, some of which were prompted by situations spanning decades. And taking the adverse childhood experience as a survey helped me to understand why my path became what it became in the absence of some certain resiliency that would activate during my recovery. I want to put my finger on age 11 for a minute because that's when a good seed was planted. I was watching MTV News as 11 year olds did at the time and host Kurt Loder did a feature on a nameless man who ran through city streets and encampments distributing syringes and naloxone, and even reversing over, uh, opioid overdoses on the spot. All of this activity, wherever he was, it was illegal. Uh, so, so said Kurt Loder, and that rebel with the cause archetype kind of became ingrained in my head from, from that moment. And uh, even if I didn't know anything about drugs at that point, I connected with the spirit of the thing. And then I would so soon need some kind of help um, and there were no answers around me at the time. I found alcohol at age 13 and found that it made me feel whole, and that quickly became problematic and remained that way until my mid-20s. I started using heroin intravenously at age 25, and just after graduating from UNH uh, is when I started. It started out as a weekend treat, and then just given my history with substances and trouble controlling my use, the heroin use became quickly uh, chaotic. Uh, only finances kept me somewhat in check, and the lack of fentanyl in my particular vendor circles kept me alive. Uh, there aren't a lot of pictures of me in the world uh, during my heaviest use period, so I've chosen to highlight uh, the friend that I first sought and used heroin with, uh, Cody. Cody was a gifted writer and all-around artist, and he died several years ago from drug poisoning, which is to say uh, fentanyl-laced heroin. Love and miss you, Cody. When I was ready for treatment of some kind, treatment wasn't ready for me. I remained on uh, waiting lists until I couldn't hold on, and then I had an effort moment one day at work. I drove to Massachusetts on a binge on heroin during a freak hurricane, and after three car accidents, I finally got arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. I made my call to stay on one treatment center's waiting list, and after describing the destruction I caused, that turned out to be the magic call. Um, the basis of social belief and activity at that treatment center was to remain abstinent forever and to do that by immersing myself in 12-step culture. The operational philosophy of this center, like many other state-funded places like it before the um, Affordable Care Act dollars helped to raise standards, was to limit choice and to confront or kick out patients who were so-called non-compliant, one of my least favorite words. Uh, my success with this treatment was uncommon based on my knowledge of how my peers fared during that treatment cycle and many others after it. And it's still the case that about uh, half to three quarters of inpatient treatment centers nationally do not utilize simple tools like buprenorphine uh, when that kind of medicine is indicated like it was for me. Uh, and may still be driving people into a narrow funnel toward abstinence-based 12-step lifestyles when that's not attractive or practical for a majority of clients, patients, etc. So I made a great life for myself, but ignored signposts of unhappiness about my environment. And in fact, uh, some sort of clinical depression or another that I hadn't squared with since my teen years, I started drinking chaotically again. Uh, but this time, my job afforded me an insurance card, and I had all the options and access I could have hoped for. And today I have a life uh, and a recovery of my own design. I'm properly diagnosed, and I'm properly treated medically for bipolar disorder. I'm going to backtrack a bit and uh, cover my career in the SUD field, which started at a sober house a couple of years after my first treatment episode. I served as uh, the case manager for anyone who came to live there, and our philosophy was about the same as the treatment fields, uh, and many of our friends in our particular corner of abstinence-based recovery at the time, which was to exclude med medications that could be uh, potentially, so, you know, scare quotes, abused, uh, including psychiatric medications, and to gather people around one or two books that proved enlightening in our lives, uh, 
those of us who are involved in this place, we're, we've drastically changed our views since those days to be inclusive of all pathways uh, and respectful of the game of individual needs. But that doesn't matter for a lot of the folks who were hurt by our care. My last interaction with a lot of them was dropping them off at a homeless shelter for non-compliance. Then I got scooped up by public health. I was working as a regional prevention coordinator for the state's bare bones prevention framework. I was immediately exposed to public health uh, concepts and in public health orientation to recovery and wellness. Uh, and to this concept that my co-presenter Haner talks about, which is the need for multiple strategies over multiple domains to address health disparities such as an overdose crisis. And I'll mention that uh, the timestamp here, the 2016 elections in New Hampshire, uh, because being in the right place in the right time allowed me platforms and opportunities that I'll describe, and which I never would have encountered without kind of politicization of this opioid overdose issue. While working in prevention, I shopped around at PowerPoint to get my region hyped up about peer recovery support services. And then I got to be the first staff member of what became a huge recovery community organization in Stratford County, uh, New Hampshire. That RCO is now part of a network of 14 RCOs statewide providing peer recovery support services uh, and purchased naloxone via 19 recovery community centers. So what happens when you put free recovery resources out on Main Street in New Hampshire in 2016? There is no door large enough, and everyone was asking for treatment services, and there wasn't much that we could do to keep the door open, except keep the door open and remain supportive. It was also during this time that I started to learn about the philosophy behind the action of that guy who was uh, reversing overdoses on the street in my childhood TV. Uh, this was called harm reduction, and its values dictate that practitioners should, first, do no harm. They should believe that people who use drugs can and often do make good choices and positive changes in their lives. That services meant for people who use drugs should be person-driven versus coercive and supportive versus punitive because that's what people deserve and that's what uh, the most effective approach is. And harm reduction is a growing group of people that encourages and, uh, and enables positive health changes with individuals, often incrementally, whether or not someone stops using substances. I also came to understand harm reduction as a framework for understanding drugs and drug use that views things through the lens of uh, science and ethics versus the morality that I was used to growing up during a drug war and then later in recovery as an abstinence crusader. Harm reduction acknowledges that some drugs and drug use are indeed safer than others for most people. And the harm reduction framework includes acknowledging that the context of use is supremely important, more so than focusing on just the drug uh, and the interaction with the brain or the person's pathology. This sub-framework for locating specific harm in drug use is referred to as drug set and setting. Otherwise, the specifics and context of the drugs used, such as their legal regulation and their purity and potency, what the person brings to the table, uh, such as their mindset uh, during the drug use, and this is called the set, and finally, whether someone uh, is out in the elements, for example, and in danger while using, or something else entirely, which is the table that the drug and the person sit at, which is the setting. And harm reduction as a phrase is one that federal health employees could scarcely utter and could not publish until recently. And this speaks to the politicization uh, of health issues and the happy changes that are afforded by time when something is just right. So my first task on my first hour on my first day as manager of the RCO uh, and its sole staff member was to go on the first crisis call for a program that I'll describe now. So somebody in addiction related crisis is to walk into a local police department to ask for SUD treatment. 
that person has to ride in the back of a cruiser to a local emergency department. The police call the RCO uh, and a peer recovery support specialist uh, is dispatched to meet the person at the uh, emergency department and the peer assists the person in navigating treatment options of which there were, you know, not at the time. This first call that I received involved two people, a couple, who showed up with suitcases, fully expecting a straight shot to inpatient treatment, uh, as was offered by similar programs in Maine and Massachusetts at the time. I met them in the waiting room in the emergency department, and after four hours of calling around for treatment options, you know, just waiting list, waiting list, waiting list, the male of the couple uh, left to go get heroin because he, with, he was withdrawing uh, unbearably. And I continued with the woman and found her a ride to an overnight holding place that connected people uh, sensibly with some treatment options, not quite a complete car wash. And in the meantime, the man who left returned to the same hospital in an ambulance, apparently overdosed. So the moral of that story is that while this program was great for PR and good feelings among certain community members, people who use drugs were clearly missing from the program's design. So here's what the U.S. was experiencing following a huge rise in crackdown on opioid prescribing. As prescriptions went sharply down at the time I went into treatment for the first time, opioid overdose deaths rose sharply. Uh, and this is because the opioid supply turned from legal and regulated sources to illegal and clandestine sources. Another reason for the sharp climb in opioid overdose deaths was that the clandestine supply of heroin was both being tainted with and replaced by entirely uh, illegally sourced or manufactured analogs of fentanyl, whose main analog is about 25 times stronger than heroin and 50 times stronger than morphine. So, what all these deaths pointed to was a dire need to get the opioid overdose medication naloxone out to people while we worked on the slower project of building a more robust treatment and recovery services infrastructure. Uh, in 2015, I had, uh, New Hampshire had the unfortunate distinction of being second in the nation for opioid overdose death rates while being first in the nation for uh, the upcoming elections, of course, and all eyes were on New Hampshire at this time. Uh, the feds released money to states for stemming their own opioid overdose death tolls. New Hampshire got about 450,000 um, to purchase and distribute naloxone. And a lot of that money went toward a multimedia, multi-year awareness campaign of which I was the face for the idea that recovery from opioid addiction is possible. Uh, so I was for sure on blast and feeling pretty guilty that the ads were um, sucking up money that I thought were better spent on the medicine. At this time, I was still working as regional prevention coordinator for Stratford County, New Hampshire. Uh, and since the naloxone money was granted through the federal prevention block grant, the bought kits were to be distributed through the state's prevention framework, which meant me for my county. Uh, the Governor's Naloxone Task Force decided to implement uh, distribution via public events, which uh, the prevention framework personnel, me, would arrange. And the events had to include one of a small number of medical professionals trained in a training of trainers to provide education at the events on how to use naloxone, which is pretty simple. There is a one kit limit per person through this program and by nature of the topic and the expectations of police as subject matter experts on addiction at the time, police were most often present at the public events. So one thing that people who use and especially inject drugs tend to steer clear from as highlighted by the other program I uh, described, which was hardly used after that first call, is police personnel. And clearly, one group of stakeholders was missing at the planning table for this naloxone distribution strategy. What the evidence says works for naloxone distribution is use a different engagement tool, such as a sterile, uh, such as sterile drug use equipment like syringes, uh, to orient people to naloxone information about other health services and referral to those services. And Decades of research tells us that people who use syringe services programs or SSPs 
are, they're about three times likelier uh, to successfully refer people to treatment, for example, than any other access point to people who use uh, and inject drugs. And it's just a tried and true design. So I got to help implement a study uh, starting in 2016 that would inform ongoing legislation uh, to uh, legalize syringe services programs in New Hampshire. We would do street outreach with naloxone and an utterly respectful approach to recruit people who inject drugs in Stratford County for about 90 minute paid interviews. And what we learned was horrifying. Despite a 19 year old New Hampshire law that stated that syringes could be sold at pharmacies without a prescription, none of the participants we interviewed could identify a single local pharmacy that would sell to them. Therefore, folks turned to less ideal means to inject drugs. Uh, they purchased syringes on the street. They used discarded syringes. They broke into biohazard containers. Uh, they reused syringes until they just wouldn't function and often recreated syringes and needles from various sources, including used syringes. One participant told me that a used syringe at that time in Stratford County could go for as much as $20 among friends. And a 2009 research article urging naloxone proliferation described naloxone distribution programs in this way. They legally distribute the medicine through standing ph uh, physician's prescriptions to those who are at risk of overdose and are most likely to be available as first responders in emergency overdose situations. All the evidence provided by both sanctioned and unsanctioned distribution programs show that people who use drugs are the most likely to be available as first responders in those situations. So that's the model that we in Stratford County followed. At first, I had willing volunteers, uh, often parents of people who use drugs, run through public event uh, distribution lines two or three times each to siphon kits off for outreach directly to people who injected opioids in our county. And once I told the state's naloxone task force that we were doing this, uh, they relented and allowed it to become a pilot for potential statewide application. And no surprise, the program proved to be much more successful than the public events in getting more kits into more hands and into the hands of folks who indeed use the kits successfully to reverse opioid overdoses. Uh, using this each one teach one model ensured that the hardest to reach populations understood how to access and use naloxone as well as a range of other non-emergency health services in their community. That same year, a mentor helped me to realize a long-held dream, which was to run through the streets uh, and encampments with safer drug use supplies, uh, in addition to naloxone kits. My basement was filled with pallets of syringes, uh, intramuscular and intranasal naloxone, drug cookers and filtering co cottons, tourniquets, and brochures that I made uh, letting folks know where to go when things went wrong in their drug use practices. I do street outreach and house calls in nearly all of my spare time, and I loved it. I made life-altering contacts uh, that showed me just what incremental recovery changes look like. This is where my paradigm truly began to change from abstinence-oriented to harm reduction-oriented. After a syringe exchange became law the following year, and therefore it may be boring for me, this one-person uh, program became the largest in the state in terms of volume of materials dispensed and people served, mostly uh, by not restricting how many items people could take and thus ensuring people who did not feel comfortable coming to our outreach sites were afforded access to those materials. Uh, New Hampshire now has a network of SSPs dis uh, distributing some of the largest volumes of naloxone among other access points. I'm not bored by harm reduction. I'm very enthusiastic about it. Uh, but when it became legal, it was a little bit of a sting, um, as well as a celebration. Uh, as many here know, it is difficult to connect individual outputs to large-scale outcomes in the substance use services field, and that's why we try to take comprehensive, inclusive approaches to substance use problem, problems. Uh, but here's what we saw in the years immediately following naloxone legalization, uh, SSP legalization, and peer-delivered naloxone programming in New Hampshire. 
a decline in people using emergency services to reverse overdoses. So there wasn't quite a reduction in instances of overdose, but it at least seemed that naloxone use by peers was working well. And during that same time range of 2018 onward, fentanyl and heroin overdoses uh, rates in New Hampshire broadly began declining for the first time since a brief lull in 2011 to 2012 when reporting was not so robust as it is today. And in 2021, uh, New Hampshire regained a little bit of face and became among three states that did not see overdose death tolls rise, unlike most other states. So one of my takeaways from all this has been to treat people like resources instead of as recipients of my best ideas or as objects to which I give ultimatums. This is what person-centered care really means. I take this attitude and I adopt it. Um, the practice of treating people in this way that I expressed um, in, the, in the rightmost column here, not just because it respects people's dignity and agency, but also because when I take this attitude and approach, people's agency can be fully expressed and people can make their own steps toward healthier lifestyles. I've also come to understand that wherever you stand uh, as an access point to people who use drugs, you can adopt harm reduction practices by at least providing relevant harm reduction information. So we can teach anyone to never use a, uh, a loan when avoidable, and there is now a number of a phone number that people can call at neveruseloan.com where volunteers listen to make sure that someone stays awake after using and calls emergency response if not. Uh, we can teach people to test for fentanyl in their cocaine, meth, heroin, etc. by using fentanyl test strips directly in their drug solution before injecting. We can teach people how to avoid STDs through safer sex practices. We can teach people to, make, to take small tester amounts of drugs before continuing with a given batch. We can teach that certain drugs don't mix well and can precipitate overdose. We can teach people to carry and how to use naloxone, and we can teach anyone safer injection practices, such as considering other routes of administration uh, than injecting, and to use sterile inject injection equipment and to never share this equipment with others. I've also learned through my experiences that each access point to people who use drugs can implement harm reduction values for improved effect in service de design and de delivery. For instance, we can act, ask ourselves while brainstorming or reviewing our programming, where might we be causing rather than preventing or relieving harm? Do we believe that people who use drugs can make healthier choices and changes? Do we behave or operate supportively versus punitively? Um, I've learned that ultimately, that when I know better, I better do better. Uh, and to close the, the time gap in between those two events, the biggest light bulb moments have centered around this fundamental harm reduction principle find a way to meaningfully involve service stakeholders in program design and delivery, or watch a program fail relative to programs that do involve direct stakeholder communities. Just throughout my short career in the SCD services so far, I've seen a steep curve in acceptance and adoption of harm reduction. So just this year, first of all, um, while I've been invited to talk to you on the topic, which was taboo not long ago, um, for federal agencies. Uh, and this year we also saw the first mention and suggestion of taking a harm reduction approach by a U.S. president, and that was during this year's State of the Union spe speech. Uh, this year the CDC advised a softening of its previous opioid prescribing guidelines and oversight uh, that caused colossally negative and unintended effects for many in our communities. And just like the 2011-2012 effort to define and outline a set of service principles for recovery for SAMHSA, this year SAMHSA convened harm reduction subject matter experts to do the same for the term harm reduction. 
And my co-presenter, Haner, and I both got to take part in that process, and it was indeed a moment to save her. So I wish that I could answer any questions in real time, uh, but please feel free to reach out if you'd like to follow up. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Hi, my name is Haner Hernandez, and uh, the topic for today is overdose prevention and naloxone lived experience and lessons from the field. Just to let you know a little bit more about myself, um, I work in the um, world of uh, substance use disorders and mental health with a specific focus on reducing disparities and building equity. I've worked in the field for the last 34 and a half years in residential settings, outpatient settings, that sort of thing. I provide clinical supervision to a number of groups on the ground, including recovery coaches, people who are doing harm reduction, folks in recovery, and I consult on a number of federally funded projects. As you can see from my name, I uh, have more letters after my name than letters in my name. I have a PhD, but I also want to let people know that I have a GED, and my GED I got in prison. I am a person in long-term recovery, which for me means that I haven't used substances, including alcohol, for the last 35 and a half years. I'm certified as a prevention specialist, certified and licensed as a drug and alcohol counselor. To get straight uh, to the presentation, I want to begin with grounding this uh, presentation on a definition of recovery that comes to us by way of SAMHSA. And recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. And we know that there are four dimensions um, that support recovery. And so the first one is health, overcoming or managing one's diseases. Um, home, a safe and stable uh, uh, place to live that supports recovery. Purpose, uh, and that includes meaningful daily activities. Uh, those include a job, school, volunteering, family caretaking or creative endeavors, and the independence, income, and resources to participate in society. This is followed by community, relationships, and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. And obviously, um, the definition of community includes a connection to the recovery community. So this is the definition that we're working off of as we think about opioid overdose and their impacts on, on communities across the United States. And we know that over 950,000 people have died since 1999. Um, this should be alarming to all of us because that is a lot of people who've died in the U.S. And then last year, a little over 101,000 people died in the U.S. as a result of opioid overdose deaths. That is the largest um, number recorded in a 12-month period, so we broke a record last year. And we know that there are disproportionate impacts. I'm going to come to this in a moment or so uh, to go a little bit deeper in terms of disproportionate impacts, but there are groups that um, have experienced disparities. And then we know that because of COVID-19, a lot of people um, have become isolated um, and many of the services that they were used to getting in person change to services that are now being provided in distance form through online platforms. And not everyone has had access to those platforms. So there are disparities in that as well. And we know through anecdotal uh, information that many people have had a reoccurrence or return to use as a result of that isolation that I was mentioning earlier. And so we see these impacts over time on people from across the country. And what I was saying earlier is that there's disproportionate impact. And so this definition here about disparities comes to us by way of Healthy People 2020. And we know that disparities are a particular uh, 
type of health difference that are closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Um, we know that disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systemically experienced greater obstacles to health. And these are based on racial ethnic groups, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive, sensory, or physical disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, geographical location or other characteristics historically, historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. Again, there are groups who experience different health conditions um, adversely and in different ways. And we know that with substance use disorders and mental health, there are many disparities um, that our folk experience on the ground. To Coming to those disproportionately impacted, we need to um, understand the impact on um, the disproportionate impact on natives, uh, native peoples in the U.S., black or African Americans, Hispanic, Latino, or Latin, Latinx populations. And we know, we've seen that um, the numbers in terms of opioid overdose deaths, as an example for African Americans, um, have shot up in recent years, as well as for Hispanic and Latinos. And we know that not everyone is dying necessarily from the use of heroin, but it is heroin laced with fentanyl. It is cocaine laced with fentanyl and other substances that contain fentanyl in them. And so these populations here have seen disproportionate impact in terms of opioid overdose deaths. And because Native people, Black, African American, and Hispanic people are also overrepresented amongst the people who are incarcerated in the U.S., therefore experiencing those disparities there as well, the population that is re-entry, in other words, coming out of prisons and jails, have been disproportionately impacted because they are at greater risk for overdosing and dying. And so all things not being equal, there are disproportionate impacts that we need to take a look at, pay attention to when we are planning, implementing, designing, and evaluating programs that are designed to um, eliminate disparities and um, reduce opioid overdose deaths. In order to do that, we need to understand and embrace a harm reduction and a prevention framework. Here we see that harm reduction are a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use. And in this case, um, we're, we're focusing on those negative consequences that include opioid overdose steps. We should also understand and note that harm reduction is a movement for social justice built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. Um, for better or for worse, whether we agree with it or not, drugs are here and people are going to use them. Actually, Focusing on harm reduction does not condone substance use. It reduces harm from using substances. And we have a lot of research that talks to that effect um, in terms of the effectiveness of harm reduction. It is a huge tool in our tool belt that we should use. And I want to connect harm reduction to recovery in this way. Recovery is harm reduction and harm reduction is recovery. All people use harm reduction. If you stop at a stoplight, if you stop at a stop sign, if you drink more water than soda like I do, if you go to the gym, um, if you look both ways before crossing the street, all of those are forms of harm reduction. And that is why I say that everyone practices harm reduction. However, when it comes to drugs and drug use, and sexual activity, for many people, harm reduction then becomes controversial. It should really not be because, again, we have evidence and data that speak to the effectiveness of harm reduction. In other words, engaging in harm reduction um, practices on the ground 
actually keep people alive and dead people do not recover. So it's important to take that into account. Disparities are a huge problem in our society. And in order to eliminate disparities, we focus on leading with equity. And so in the image on, on the screen, you see that there are three people trying to look over the fence to watch a ball game. In the far right, you see equality. And you see that the three people are of different heights, yet they have the same boxes. And so the smallest person here cannot see over the fence to watch the ball game. Yet we talk about equality as it exists in society. And the reality is for me and for many others on the ground that equality only exists in the minds of people with power and privilege. If I take you to the far right where you see reality, now the smallest person who could not see over the fence, even when they had one box, now they are in a ditch. And what we want you to think of is the fact that many people are relegated to a ditch even before they're born. There's such a thing that is called generational poverty. There are some people who go around telling people, if you work hard enough, if you just work hard enough, you're going to come out of that predicament. Well, working hard is a factor in coming out of issues of disparities. But the reality is, is that there's something called generational poverty. And there are people who work two and three jobs and they work really hard and they work more hours than I do in a day, yet they will never make what I make in a day working an entire week. And so it's important to emphasize hard work and people in recovery across the country have worked really hard to come out of those predicaments, but there are structural issues that are in place that don't allow people to come out of those predicaments fully. And so now you look at the person in the middle and that person has the same box. They only have enough to see over the fence and watch the ball game. And then the tallest person who didn't need a box to begin with now has seven boxes, right? And so there's some people in society who have a lot of resources and privilege in society that enable them to participate fully, yet others are relegated to that ditch that I was talking about. I am frequently reminded of the privilege and power that I have as a man in recovery in this country who has been in recovery for over 35 years, I have a job, I have a home, I have a retirement account. I have a lot of things in place that other people don't have. And I would encourage you to look inward. What is the power and privilege that you hold? And how can we use that power and privilege to help other people who need help, who need us to focus on issues of equity? So now I take you to, to the middle of this depiction where it says equity. And now that you see that the three boxes are distributed differently, the smallest person now has two boxes. The person in the middle has one box and the tallest person doesn't have any boxes at all, but all three of them can view over the fence and watch the ball game. And for some people, emphasis on some people, this is, this is what is defined as equity. I would respectfully disagree with that and say that the obvious problem that has been staring us in the face is the fence. And we want to remove that fence because remove, removing that fence allows people to participate fully in the ball game, if you will. And that fence represents policies and procedures that have been set up in our system, in our field, in our society that keep people out. I'm sure that if you wanted to watch a ball game, you would want to watch that game from the bleachers and not be singled out and marginalized outside of a fence. So it's a way of critical thinking in terms of thinking about equity that we need to do as much as possible to eliminate the policies and procedures that keep people outside of participating fully. And we want you to think about what those policies and procedures are in the area of substance use and mental health 
as it relates to opioid overdoses in this country. There are roles that people in recovery can and should and are playing to support developing equity and to support the reduction in opioid overdose steps or the elimination of them. Um, people in recovery participate as staff, recovery coaches, mentors, and other positions within our field. This is the largest explosion in the workforce. Um, people in recovery help build collaborations with the recovery community and with people who use substances because we come at this by utilizing our lived experience and by doing so, we can connect people on the ground to services that are available in communities. We help build recovery capital. That means the internal resources and external resources that are required to sustain recovery over time. Internal recovery capital includes our ability to say yes, our ability to advocate for oneself, our ability to advocate on behalf of others, our resiliency, and our roadmap to what has worked and what hasn't worked in our lives. External recovery capital includes the things that we presented earlier as it relates to the domains of recovery, a recovery conducive place to live, having health insurance, having a health care provider, utilizing that health care provider, uh, knowing where the services exist in the communities, and our, again, I will end with our ability to advocate on our behalf um, in terms of recovery and recovery supports. Um, recovery, people in recovery facilitate access to and share harm reduction, reentry, multiple pathways of recovery, and other community-based resources. So people in recovery have a wealth of information and knowledge that help people access and sustain recovery over time. In terms of the focus on the ground and in communities and what we've learned is that we should lead with cultural humility. Cultural humility incorporates a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique. Self in other words, I am not just looking at the people who are in front of me. I am looking at myself and to figure out what biases, what judgments, what strengths, what abilities do I bring to this endeavor in terms of helping people recover, and that I understand that that commitment is a lifelong commitment, and that I seek to redress power imbalances. In other words, the people who come to me for help, they are in a position of vulnerability, and my work is to help them gain power and knowledge and recovery capital. My work is not to be paternalistic in telling people what to do and how to engage in recovery, but my work is to develop advocacy partnerships. In my life, I am able to do advocacy and do the work that I do because the people who came before me, my mentors, my guides, my sponsors, all of those people helped me to understand what it means to be in advocacy partnerships, what it means to be an advocate in this field. And in that way, they provided to me the hope, support, and guidance that I needed. And in many instances, they believed in me more than what I believed in myself. And a cultural, humble approach includes doing that. In other words, holding people up until the point in time where they can lift themselves up and sustain recovery over time. The other thing that we have to do and we should do is to acknowledge that there's such a thing as the multiple pathways of recovery. And so those include harm reduction. Does harm reduction work? Of course it works. Is it for everybody? Yes. What about faith pathways in recovery? Of course they work. Are they for everybody? No. What about uh, 12 steps and recovery? Do they work? The answer to that is yes. Are they for everybody? No. Exercise in recovery, does it work? Of course it works. It helps people, many people. Does exercise apply to everybody? Well, it doesn't apply to everybody. We have smart recovery, rational recovery, celebrate recovery. Do those pathways work? Of course they do. Are they for everybody? No. We have um, 
holistic approaches in recovery, which include meditation, yoga, acupuncture, do they work? The answer to that is yes. Are they for everybody? The answer to that is no. You get what I'm saying by way of the multiple pathways. What we need to do is to put options in front of people. I recommend that the, we take a page out of the restaurants in this country. Think back the last time you went to a restaurant. They sat you down, they offered you something to drink, and then they put a menu in front of you, and they asked you, what are you going to have? They didn't say you're having hot dogs whether you like it or not. And your only options is to decide if you want relish ketchup or mustard. In other words, those options, when you decided what you wanted to eat, you either liked what you wanted and you had more of it, or you didn't like it and you selected something different. And also you told your friends about that restaurant, whether you liked it or not, or you went somewhere else. In the field of substance use disorders and mental health, we need to do just that. We need to stop telling people what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And then when it doesn't work, we blame them for their predicament. Again, the cultural humility way of doing things is to look inward, to put options in front of people and to allow them to select what works best for them. And that is how we should approach the multiple pathways of recovery, which also include medication assisted recovery. Does it work? Yes. Is it for everybody? No. Formal treatment, outpatient, residential, do those work? Yes. Are they for everybody? No. Again, options, allowing people to choose what works best for them. And if something didn't work, we should not be punitive. We should celebrate the fact that at the very least, they understand that that didn't work for them. And again, we go back to the options and allow them to decide what's going to work for them. In terms of work on the ground, this is we've learned this from across the country in the work that we've done, that there needs to be coordination and collaborations with a number of groups. And those include groups from the recovery community, from the multiple pathways, from the faith-based groups, from the 12-step groups. For We need their involvement at all stages of the work that we do if we are going to continue to reduce opioid overdose deaths and help people gain access to recovery and sustain recovery over time. We need partnerships with syringe access and harm reduction programs. Regardless of what our feelings are about harm reduction and syringe access, we should understand that the literature is very clear, that those initiatives help people get into recovery and sustain recovery over time. And again, I wanna emphasize the fact that dead people don't recover. In syringe access programs, we do ed education and help people to understand what to do and not share needles, what to do and not to use drugs alone because that puts them at higher risk for um, overdosing and dying. We teach people how to use clean syringes and clean equipment so that they don't become infected with HIV hepatitis C, and other sexually transmitted diseases. So we need partnerships as much as possible with those programs. We need partnerships with community-based organizations. In these spaces and places, there are people who have access to resources around housing, around employment, around training, around the things that people need to enter into a life of recovery and sustain recovery over time. We need collaborations with folks in the criminal justice systems. And we have seen what those mean on the ground for people. We now have police officers embedded with recovery coaches, visiting people after they overdose and helping them to get into care. We know and see that we have drug courts, we have mental health courts, we have um, veterans courts, and all of those spaces and places are designed to help people gain access to recovery and wellness. And so those collaborations um, are important for us to engage in. We need collaborations with healthcare settings because we know people need access to health insurance. They also need health access to primary care. They need access to um, services that are connected to co-occurring disorders. We know that our folk coming out of 
issues of active addiction. Many have diabetes. They have uh, never or rarely been to a dentist. So they need to be connected to those spaces and places around healthcare settings. And we are responsible for um, making those connections for people and doing warm handoffs. And we certainly need connections with family serving programs and organizations because those programs help with family reunification. They help with bridging the gap between quality of care and access to services, right? And so these collaborations, we learned a great deal from them on the ground and others. Now, there's such a thing as informal collaborations. What we've learned from communities on the ground that what works best is formal collaborations. In other words, that we establish memorandums of agreement, memorandums of understanding with organizations so that there's sustainability over time. If I, as an individual, develop a relationship and a collaboration with a person, for example, in a syringe access program, when that person leaves or I leave, there goes the relationship. But if we formalize them with MOAs and MOUs, we thereby increase the probability that those collaborations exist above and beyond my participation. Finally, I want to thank you for your attention, for all the work that you're doing on the ground. I want to continue to encourage you to partner with people in recovery. We are interested in continuing to make contributions and give back to society. We, there are many people like me who are interested in partnering and connecting the treatment world to the recovery world, the prevention world to the harm reduction world. We serve as links in those regards. So I wanna thank you for all the work that you're doing on the ground. And I want to thank you for your attention to this issue. Hopefully we can continue to eliminate health disparities, build equity, and eliminate uh, opioid overdoses. Thank you, muchas gracias. Communities across the nation are mobilizing to address opioid and stimulant use and the overdose crisis. You can't overcome this alone, but we can, together, and we are. We are the Opioid Response Network a coalition of 40 national organizations representing more than 2 million people. We serve all 50 states and nine territories locally through our network of nearly 1,000 professionals working across prevention, treatment, and recovery. For state agencies, organizations big and small, and individuals working to address local needs, we bring training and education to bear on your efforts. We're here to help you help others through evidence-based support, all at no cost to you. For instance, the Opioid Response Network helped the Tribal College in New Mexico join forces with local organizations to develop a culturally appropriate prevention, treatment, and recovery training series for its students. In Rhode Island, we convened correction staff from 34 states to share how our program had reduced post-incarceration overdose deaths by more than 60% and supported them in their efforts to build similar programs in their home states. In West Virginia, we mobilized to help a clinic incorporate substance use disorder services into their practice, serving a faith-based community. We helped healthcare providers in South Dakota address barriers they face providing treatment services for their patients. We're here to help those on the front lines. So what are your needs and how can we help? Visit the opioidresponsenetwork.org to learn more and to submit a request for support. The Opioid Response Network funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration.